Well, hello, and welcome to the Well After Hours. I'm your host, Beverly Allen, and I'm glad you're back with us to have another great conversation today that is centering around salvation and social justice. And to help me have this great conversation is my special guest, who is the leading faith voice in New Jersey for racial justice issues, for the campaign to abolish the drug war, and also the criminalization of Black people. Not only that, but he is also the founder and executive director of the faith-based organization in Trenton, New Jersey, Salvation and Social Justice. And if that's not enough, he's also the 68th pastor of the Greater Mount Zion AME Church, also based in Trenton. I want to welcome my very special guest today, Reverend Dr. Charles F. Boyer. Thank you, Dr. Boyer, for coming to the well. Uh, thank you so much for having me. It's a great honor to, to be here and to have a conversation. After all the work you've done, we can't help but have your voice amplified on the well. And I have to say, speaking of you as the 68th pastor of Greater Mount Zion AMA Church, you also celebrated your second pastoral anniversary this year. And I'm I'm wondering, you must have landed in Trenton running on your feet, running, taking off because, I mean, you just became the pastor. You set up this organization. You know, what was the impetus <laughs> or to get you going like that? Or was this something you had researched beforehand that you had planned to do when you got there? Because you've, you've served as pastor uh, in other several other churches prior to this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, um, well, one, I'm, I, just, I was just so privileged that the African Methodist Episcopal Church would uh, send us to one of our historic churches, uh, one one of our founding and oldest churches uh, in African Methodism uh, here in the city of Trenton and in, in the capital. And, um, you know, salvation and social justice and much of the policy work and, and advocacy uh, had been taking place for many years, uh, and 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 the church, uh, you know, being a major kind of um, uh, at one time a majorly political church or a, a, a space of black political power for us here in the seat of of, of the state's capital, um, they they really wanted to reinvigorate that and 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 reached out to uh, to me to Rosalie and I to to take over uh, as pastor here and to reinvigorate things and bring uh, a lot of what we had going on already. And also knowing that we were in Trenton all, all the time over on State Street at, at, the, uh, uh, at the State House and advocating. And so it just worked out really well. So we moved Salvation and Social Justice here. Uh, and then that also allowed us to kind of do some direct impact on the groundwork here in the city. And so we, yeah, we, we, we hit the ground running and, and we're grateful. And you haven't stopped. <laughs> uh, um, and, and I want to ask you, uh, since before we get into all of the little nuggets about salvation and social justice, could you just kind of like identify, I, we have your bio. I know they saw the bio in the opening of the show, but we just want to let them hear a little bit more of your voice to identify, you know, who you are, what you've done briefly. Oh yeah, well, yeah, well, thank, thank you. I mean, I am, a, I'm a third generation AME preacher. My, my, my grandfather, my, my pop up was an AME preacher uh, in North. My father was a longtime uh, pastor in Patterson. Uh, I grew up in Plainfield, New Jersey, but North and Patterson are, are really my ministerial roots. Uh, come to this work, uh, understanding that. African Methodism was a major part of the Black liberation struggle here in the United States. You know, it was birthed out of uh, the fight for freedom and emancipation. And so having this deep calling growing up in the state of New Jersey, uh, uh, impacted by state trooper racial profiling, all of those things impacted by the drug war, uh, and, 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 and finding my way, this calling from God to... Uh, uh, calling me to deal with what what I would call the slavery of our day, mass incarceration, and so that that's what kind of brings brings me to this work and been privileged through our organization, uh, through this ministry, through this work, and now the pastoral charge here uh, in Trenton uh, to to actually do that, to work on the liberation of Black people, whether that be 
uh, through criminal justice, through through prison releases, through uh, through uh, police accountability, whether that be through birthing justice and the massive inequities and uh, how, how how black women are treated in the healthcare systems, uh, whether that be economic or educational pieces. So we we do a lot of deep dive work in the policy area. We do work here on the ground, uh, you know, with 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 black mothers, with housing insecurity, with food insecurity, with gun violence, and so uh, we're, we're we're grateful to do it. And uh, by no means am I doing any of this by myself. My wife is a, a major partner uh, in everything that's being done, and the great people, both in Greater Mount Zion and the team, the very young team we have here at Salvation and social justice are the ones that really make it all happen. Wow. I tell you, um, yes, as, a, as, a, as I also learned too, that uh, Lady Rosalie Boyer is also a co-founder of the organization with you. And you all yeah. are a real ministry power team. And you know, I don't say this lightly, but pastors have such, I don't want to say a burden, but such a heavy job to do. I mean, you have to keep a people or a community motivated when they're going through the daily struggles of life that many of their white counterparts or other you know ethnicities do not go through they don't face it they don't understand it but we have to deal with it every single day no matter where we are or what we're doing there's always you know a hint of it somewhere and you have to keep everybody lifted up i always say as pastors with hope yeah. That's you right. know, and it it can't be just a Sunday message, you know, but you need a Sunday message to get you from, you know, Monday to Sunday and right. back again. But yet to deal, you know, to actually take a, a stand and to be involved. And I love the way um, you're, you, you, you state your mission. You said our mission is to abolish structural racism and liberate public policy theologically by modeling and building the hope and resiliency of black faith where historically marginalized people move from lament to liberation by advocating, envisioning, and creating their own community-led solutions. That is really, really something. Uh, it's quite a job to do. And you yourself have to actually believe the vision to even you know, set forward in that goal. And um, it's so monumental. <laughs> But you know what? It, it just speaks to your faith. I mean, because there are many pastors who are, um, as you say, benefiting or their congregants are benefiting from the work and the labor of others when they themselves are not involved in it. And I've thought about that. And maybe you could address for me, why is it that some pastors that are non-Black or, you know, other ethnic groups. And I don't even want to just say, you know, a white evangelicals or white Christian leadership, um, because there are others that come from other countries that also are, are Christian leaders now in this country, but they don't always join, you know, forces, you know, with, with the struggle of, uh, of African Americans uh, in yeah. a Christian environment. Why is that? Is there some big fear or what is the big threat to them, why they don't engage? Yeah, yeah I think you I mean, think it, that it really they hits on. Yeah, I, I I think the the biggest piece really is theological, which is why we we come to this from a particular theological lens. Uh, you know, from a liberation theology lens, you know, you must advocate, right? And so, you know, to you know, G Jesus said, I must go, but I'm going to send you another advocate is, mm -hmm. is what the language, right? And so the, 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 the Holy Spirit is one of not only comfort and peace and self-regulation, but is actually a spirit of advocacy. And so to understand the scriptures from a particular way, the, the, the entire prophetic tradition is one that speaks truth to power. And it's one that, 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 calls folks to the carpet for taking advantage of the widow, the poor, the, 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 the orphan, right? The, of the economic oppression. That is what it is. Mm -hmm. And what has happened is that, you know, Western theological contexts for the most part have, have taken uh, 
sacred texts written by oppressed people and have co-opted it and given and taught it from the oppressor's lens. And so many of our folks, I mean, not only white evangelicals, but you have many black folks and folks coming from other, other countries who have really taken on uh, a westernized kind of white terroristic theological lens, which has always been harmful, which delivered to us the slave Bible, which 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 financed, you know, Christians who financed slavery, which 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 taught us to hate ourselves, which taught us slaves obey your master, but totally said nothing about let my people go. It said nothing about I came to set the captives free. And so if you come to uh to religion from a punitive theological oppressor's lens, then you say nothing because you agree with the oppression that's going on. And, 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 and you think that advocacy at best is charity. And so to give somebody some clothes or, or to do a food bank is enough in your mind. But to eliminate poverty and to eliminate nakedness and to call out those that make people naked and hungry, uh, is not even in your purview because you've not only been taught the scriptures wrong, but you teach the scriptures wrong. That could have been a master class right there. <laughs> uh, but but it's so true, you know, because I've I've often you know thought about that because you I've read where sometimes we're um, it seems like there's two gospels, like there's the gospel with evangelism, and then there's the social gospel, the way people separate it, as though you could. You know, yeah. scriptures, as you say, clearly teach, you know, love thy neighbor. And, uh, you know, as you say, they do you think they really don't know? I mean. <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah. No, I, they, they they really do know. But it is, I mean, uh, in, in, in many ways, the I, I say to folks, you know, the. the the scripture in some ways is a book of competing theologies. Uh, and for Christians, uh, Jesus comes and makes sense of it all and, 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 and puts the stamp on it and says, love the Lord your God, right? And yeah. love your neighbor as yourself, and he, right? Jesus delivers the beatitude, the, the poor shall inherit the earth, right? And, you know, those who hunger and thirst for justice, right? So Jesus comes and delivers a very particular gospel and what those what what many do is they often elevate the gospel of others and minimize the gospel that Jesus taught. And so you can't call yourself a Christian if you dismiss Jesus's ministry. Uh, and, and and you can't prioritize the three days of the death of the crucifixion, death, and resurrection and dismiss the three years of ministry and teaching on the ground. Mm -hmm. If they don't have equal weight, then you're only preaching a very small portion of Jesus' ministry and work. So, so I, I believe Jesus had just as much, as, as there, there's even more power and potency in Jesus' three years of active ministry than three days of dying on the cross and being resurrected. So that, that may be you know, the culmination, but it means nothing without the three years. Wow. You just answered the question that my next question was going to be, you put that, you encompassed everything in that answer, um, because that's one of the things that I was going to, you know, ask you about is how, you know, they line up the scriptures or how they, you know, can actually, or anyone can actually line up the scriptures in the absence of knowing, you know, it's for all people. But um, speaking of some of the things that you have done through um, salvation and social justice. Uh, there are several things that um, you have been de dealing with. And one of them is the legislation which would establish community-led first response team pilot programs throughout the state of New Jersey. And I, I don't know, but um, I had heard that one time, and I guess the laws have been changed. They change it back and forth. There was a time when certain communities uh, that were policed were policed by those that lived within that community. And how that got disbanded or for what reasons it got disbanded, I don't know. But it seems like you're leading that conversation back again to open up. Like, why can't we have 
regulation over our own communities? Why does it have to take somebody else to come in here? Can you speak to that issue for the viewers? Yeah, yeah, yeah. and thank, thank you for that, for that question. I mean, the reality is, is that most pretty, most of the communities outside of black communities are policing themselves, right? So white officers are, are, are the ones that are policing the white communities. And we see that there is not massive, huge police presence in white communities. And so in, in uh, prosperous white communities, they have a small police force. Uh, they, they, they've got the judge, they've got the jury, they've got the economics, they've got the community programs, they have the resources. In black communities though, it's mostly white officers from outside the community that are policing us, right? And this, this is why the, the problems arise. And what we're advocating for by no means is more, more policing or more black police officers. But what we're saying is, is that the majority of things that are taking place in black communities that these outside occupying forces are actually doing, uh, they're policing mostly nonviolent quality of life issues and just exacerbating and making the problems worse rather than getting at the root causes in which poverty exacerbates. And so what we're saying is, is that uh, to, to allow folks from the community born and raised in these communities where the people know them and they know the people because then they have better discernment of what is a, 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 a situation which should be elevated here versus a situation that needs to be handled like this. Um, those are the folks that 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 should be uh, in charge of those communities. And certainly, look, we, we get it. We understand that there's certainly uh, sometimes majorly violent situations. And so the, the case that we're making is, is that for nonviolent quality of life issues, for, for um, issues that are better handled through harm reduction services, through social, social kind of services, through connections, through conflict resolution, through restorative justice practices, that let's begin to invest in the infrastructure where uh, people on the ground are able to uh, bring about community-led solutions rather than investing more and more into police which which we have which we have seen that more police and more prisons only make our communities worse, uh, and all that does is exacerbate families, breaks families apart, and destabilizes our communities. Whereas if we begin to invest in people to be the solutions themselves, we will see a massively uh, different kind of response from our communities. And, and who better than people who were formerly system involved or people who may be on the brink of, of, of maybe joining a gang to now be folks who are now involved in the revitalization of their community and doing positive things. And, 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 and the deciding factor nine times out of 10 of, what, of where that person will go is economics. And so if they are paid at the same level that we currently pay police and we give them pensions and all these kind of things to now be positive forces in their community, we as a community can begin to be on a recruiting end of our young people to now be part of the solutions rather than the problems. Wow. Well, <laughs> um, I was just wondering then, You've faced this, you know, um, time and time again, as far as trying to push this through. What does it seem like? What are their arguments against it or their biggest fears against seeing this happening? Yeah. So, I mean, we we I mean, I, I praise God because we the bill is through the assembly right now. So the full assembly has voted on it. And so we're grateful for that. We have to get movement in the Senate now. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the biggest argument against it or what makes people uneasy, frankly, is 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 the law enforcement lobby. Right. There's there's a fear. I mean, when, when you strip what's what's actually what what's being said versus what's really behind it, really what it's all about is. And, and, and I will say this is more from lawmakers than it actually is from police, which is which is super ironic. 
uh, is is this fear to feel like something is being taken away from police. Now, the whole reason we even started on this campaign was years ago, you know, the the all the situations of, of um, folks uh, dying across the country at the hands of police and also um, uh, what came out here in New Jersey, the disproportionate use of force on black people here in the state of New Jersey and talking to people on the ground in communities who who came to us with this. And, and this is why we're advocating for. But we also heard from law enforcement, which made a very good point. Law enforcement at every level, I have heard say, uh, society fails young people and people through housing, through economics, through education, and, and through and mental health resources have been stripped out of communities. And when it gets to the crisis moment, then we're called in. Mm -hmm. And if we don't do everything perfectly and it goes left, then we're demonized. We cannot be educators, community workers, social service people, mental health professionals, and everything. We're police. We are not equipped to do this. And 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 they make they make the point. Law enforcement law enforcement does not, for the most part, want to deal with all drug situations. They don't want to deal with the mental health situations. They don't want to deal with all of that. So let's not have them deal with any of them. Mm -hmm. And so, but I think this, this constant, the strength of kind of like the police union lobby and what all that means, I think a lot of lawmakers are free to do anything that would in any way seem like uh, they're taking something away from police. So a lot of the work we're actually doing is trying to work with some law enforcement uh, at higher levels to have these conversations with lawmakers so that they 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 can see that this this is something that not only benefits black people on the ground and benefits black communities but it's also something that benefits police these things can work in tandem because at the end of the day police don't want to be doing 90 percent of what they're doing already wow um uh, when you said they uh one of the things when you said about the fear of them losing something like they're losing something i thought about it at one time about how much correction officers are paid the people within the prison system they get pretty high salaries for doing those jobs and i'm saying that they shouldn't but the prisons are keeping people <laughs> well paid yes. and and increased lifestyle <laughs> And 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 they're prospering, you know, and I don't, you know, how can, I guess there is some fear right. of a loss of that. That really is true. It's part of it. But it's, you know, it also kind of shows like why of mass incarceration, you right. need that in order to keep them That's right. exactly. in those positions, you know? Exactly. Yeah. No, you're, 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 you're spot on. I mean, you know, when, when we uh, when we worked, I mean, over the course of the past ten years, the prison population has reduced massively in the state of New Jersey, and that has turned into prison closures, right? But that, I mean, the the the, the pushback, I mean, was specifically around that. And I say to people, listen, I get it; it's hard. And I I have black folks coming and saying, you know, a lot of our folks work in the prisons. You know, and I, and I said, just listen to that. I mean, I get it. I hear it. But but think about this in the context of slavery. Mm -hmm. Would you be advocating to keep slavery in place because there were a few black folks that actually did get paid to oversee the unpaid labor? I mean, think about that. If If you are benefiting from a slave economy, you need to do some soul searching. Mm -hmm. As as they say, if you're not part of the solution, then you're part of the problem. <laughs> you know, and you know, um, I just want to take a moment here because I want to share information about salvation and social justice and about Greater uh, Mount Zion AME Church. We want to put up information so people know how to contact you uh at any point. Um to be involved and to be help, you know, help. I'm sure you could use volunteers. I'm sure you could use more pastors and, you know, congregants to help in the, the 
monumental job that uh, Salvation and Social Justice is doing. So viewers, don't go away. We're just going to show you, uh, give, share some information with you, and we'll be right back. responsibility for themselves. Um, the, the very definition or the argument has been with crime in our community, why doesn't the community stand up? Why don't people take personal responsibility? Here is a situation where the community is crying to take responsibility for itself. And so what, what reason would we ever have across political spectrum to keep people from having the resources to take responsibility and ownership of their own community. The majority, this is by police accounts, the majority of calls that come into police are nonviolent. The majority of calls do not uh, necessitate somebody with a gun. So just, just that reality alone lets us know um, that there are situations we need to work out, but the majority of situations that law enforcement is currently responding to does not necessitate uh, an armed response. Finally, let me just say a couple of pieces. Policing in the way that we know it is not designed by everyone's admission to deal with root causes. It is a response to symptoms. And so community-led first response by trying to connect people, by understanding what is the root issue at hand, seeks to deal with the root issue, not merely the symptom. Years ago, what really sparked this in my mind was hearing from police officers who said, society fails people at every point of the life, life cycle. Education, economics, joblessness, mental health. And when it all falls apart, the folks who are called to respond when it's in crisis are police. And we're expected to be the everything for everybody. And then when it doesn't go right, we are demonized. This bill is a response to what police have said is an injustice for them. And so if communities are given the right and the resources to do better by ourselves, we create a better New Jersey and a more just system. And so I thank you for your leadership. I thank the assembly. I thank uh, the speaker. I thank all of those involved because this is the righteous path. This is the moral path. This is the humane path. This is how you lead with love, rather than protect interests that merely want to beat everybody down, as opposed to responding with the most humane, loving, compassionate way we possibly can. We don't have all the answers, but when we have the will, we'll figure it out. Thank you.
Okay, well, we're back and I'm sure you enjoyed receiving all of that information and seeing what some of what salvation and social justice is all about. And we're just sharing a part of it. It's so much broader and bigger than that. And it can use more hands. And I hope it will uh, inspire many people to, you know, become a part of and at least play some part, even in giving. <laughs> you know, uh, some people uh, don't have the ability maybe to uh, do some of the physical things, but it can always help if you give financially. So, um, Dr. Boyer, I know you don't want to toot your horn, but I do want to talk about some of the things that um, salvation and social justice has accomplished. Um, one of the major things was, uh, well, there's many major things, but two of the major, one of the major things I wanted to bring out was that um, the advocacy that led to over 8,000 people being released from prison during the pandemic. Can you tell the viewers about that? That, whew, I could only imagine what you, what they went through, what they had to go through to get that done. Yeah, thank, thank you for that, for that question. Is it really, uh, you know, we all remember uh, the, the start of the pandemic and it was, it, it was massively stressful situation, no matter who you are and what context, none of us knew what the next day was going to look like. And, and, and in the midst of that, um, you know, given work prior that we had done uh, around voting rights and solitary confinement and uh, coalitions that we had built, we were being flooded with phone calls and uh, emails and, uh, you know, JPay uh, emails from folks incarcerated from family members. Uh, people were, were dying in prison. People were sick. People didn't know, hadn't heard from family members. Last they heard they had COVID. They didn't know where they were. People were, bodies were being moved around. And then, and, and it, it, it was so enormously terrifying. I mean, the amount of correspondence we were getting and we felt I'll be honest I mean personally it was like a personal crisis moment from a ministry standpoint but I never felt so helpless mm -hmm. uh and 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 as the numbers were 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 coming out you know New Jersey was the deadliest prison system in the nation uh, per capita of how many people were dying in prisons. Um, and at this time, uh, at the same time, the governor was having daily briefings uh, and lifting up people who were dying from COVID. And they were all, you know, um, you know, the social elite uh, <laughs> names of you know, former politicians or, you know, uh, clergy or business people and never mentioning, not even mentioning one of these people who were dying in prison. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, it, it, it became a massive burden to us as an organization, to, uh, to, to, to many of our partners, uh, to many of the directly impacted formerly incarcerated people that that are now on the outside that are that are advocates uh, and we we just uh, were all collectively getting at what can be done and so we partnered with 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 the ACLU uh, who uh, drafted a bill about the prison credit release and so you know currently there's credits given for time served for various different things. And I think it was brilliant on their part to, to think about this in that vein and to do it as a health credit. So time served during the pandemic, there were so many people within one, two, three years of release that had already served long sentences. And if they were to be, be released, uh, would greatly reduce the prison population and then therefore could create space because as we know that it was close contact 
And so we we partnered together on the drafting of, of this bill and advocated together. And what we as Salvation and Social Justice did, you know, we made the moral framing. I mean, um, really, in during the pandemic, the least of these, the most forgotten about, the most nobody wanted to care about were the folks incarcerated, right? So somebody had to had to step in and speak out for them. We organize, and, and you also remember during this time, uh, especially if there's any clergy, uh, you could not hold funerals mm-hmm. at this time. That I mean, at that time, you couldn't even hold funerals outdoors. Uh, you couldn't even have, uh, early on in, in the pandemic, you couldn't even have gravesite funerals. That's what I was right? about to say. <laughs> you couldn't exactly. bury people. You couldn't even, right, you couldn't even bury folks. I mean, there was, so there was no way to even mourn. And so we we held some online vigils so people could could mourn and people could express their lament for what was going on and people they they had lost or were losing or hadn't heard from. And then we also staged uh, a funeral, the good old black funeral mm-hmm. out in the parking lot, which was right across uh, from the war memorial where the governor was given the daily briefings. And and we put together a campaign that says, say their names, mm. you know, say they matter too. They are human beings as well. Say their names. And we, we had a list of people's names who had, who had died in prison. And mm. so we said their names if no one else was going to say their names. And we, out in that parking lot, we had a funeral. We had a funeral procession. There was singing. We, there, there, there was, there was eulogy. There was advocacy. There was outcry. And and you remember at this time there wasn't even a lot of outdoor gatherings, but there we we gathered about 500 cars. There were over a thousand people who came together, and these were family members of of, of folks uh, and and advocates. Um, and and we had a hearse and everything. And after the the funeral outside, we we got in and had a funeral procession that went all that circled the the war memorial. And on that same day introduce that piece of legislation that would get those folks out of prison. Uh, and, 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 and we're, we're grateful to God that that advocacy, that, that push, uh, that ultimately lawmakers heard the moral clarion call that we had to do something. And New Jersey went from the deadliest state, uh, in regards to deaths in prison, um, to one of the most progressive states in regards to, to to the most progressive state in regards to how many people have been released from prison. So we went from the worst to the best with one with 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 one piece piece of advocacy. And I also have to say that um, uh, the folks who have been let out uh, as a result of this uh, policy. Uh, had even lower recidivism rates than normal. And New Jersey has pretty low recidivism rates as they are in comparison um, to most states. But these folks had even lower recidivism rates. It was about 3%. So you're talking about 8,000, and and those numbers are even closer to 9,000 now. Only 3%, only 3% ended up um uh returning and a lot of those were over technical pieces and so um you know we're we're grateful i really i'm I'm grateful to god to have been a been a part of it and for one of the most challenging points stressful points in ministry um to to also be the piece that i mean i really can't point to anything more than that that in my mind gets at the heart of, of the ministry and the work of Jesus, where Jesus said, I, I came to set the captives free. And so to me, liberation about literally getting folks out of incarceration is just a monumental moment. And I praise God for, for God's favor to, to, to save these lives. Wow. I tell you, talk about being raised up for such a time as this, yeah. you know, to, for you to uh, be in a position where you say at first you felt helpless, but you know what? Your faith <laughs> and and the direction of the Holy Spirit leading it comb- and bringing you together with the right persons to help, you know, actually formulate that. That is absolutely uh, so encouraging, you know, 
that we can say he truly is a present help in the time of trouble. Wow. I tell you, well, you know, I know sometimes people will ask the question, um, what can I do? And how do you think that Christian lay members and Christian pastors could uh, actually how they should engage in social justice? Yeah. Yeah. So there's there, there's several different ways. I mean, one, um, you know, here in the state of New Jersey, we're always looking for partners. We have what we call the Black Church Collaborative. And so certainly if you get in touch with us through the ways that were shown earlier, we can link you in with the Black Church Collaborative, which we are actively pulling together. And we consistently, we constantly have uh, issue areas um, that, that, that we can work. And certainly as we lobby and push and advocate with lawmakers, every Black church sits specifically within the seat of a lawmaker. And so your ability to speak out on these particular issues, to pull those meetings together with those lawmakers, certainly we have, we meet with all of them, but it's always that much more powerful when we have the constituency of that lawmaker. And so that church is a constituency, which means you have voting power, which means you have power, which means that elected official has to listen to you. And so, so by being part of the Black Church Collaborative, by also just paying attention to our email alerts and things that have uh, certain points of, of advocacy uh, is, is a major part of that. Secondly, and also in correlation with that, on our website, we have designed what we call pulpit toolkits, hmm. which are both designed not only for the pul pulpit, but for lay people as well. And so over our various issue areas, um, we we have designed these documents. So whether on police accountability, voting, you know, souls to the polls, um, uh, uh, black health uh, equity, particularly around uh, uh, black mothers and, and the maternal health crisis, we we have supports to help preachers preach on it, teach Bible studies on on a particular issue, uh, how to do social media posts about it. Um, how to advocate for it, the bills and the policy pieces that are there. And so this is like a hands-on piece which people can download, uh, can give out to the congregation, can utilize that as a resource. We encourage people to take those kind of pieces and make the Sunday out of it. Invite us. We'll come. We'll send one of our organizers out to be there uh, on that Sunday, you know, preach about it, talk about it, bring us in and do a workshop, whatever it is. Uh, and so those 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 are some of the it's some of the ways and certainly and I'm glad that you brought up earlier my wife uh, was certainly as she's the head of development. I mean certainly um, donating to our cause our long term goal which which is our long long term goal. One of these days I'm prayerful that we are fully funded or at least 50% funded by the black church for us, by us. Mm. Ultimately, we want to be self-funded and self-reliant uh, because, you know, right now we're grateful for all of our resource partners, but the greatest power we can have is to be as self-sufficient as possible. And so we, we, we look to be a resource for the black church, for black people. And so our long-term goal, we, we advocate, we're, we're prayerful. Uh, that that the black church would continue to see us as a resource and 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 would help to uh, to to resource the work that we do. And and the wonderful thing is because I know that even uh, there's been a lot of conversation online about the uh, strength or the purpose of the black church because some people didn't feel like the black church was not as involved or engaged as they have been in the past. And yes. I think the membership uh, and therefore other people were jumping out there doing things, doing something. It may not have always been the right direction. And right. some people were piggy piggybacking their causes onto that, you know. Um, and so the fact that you put together these toolkits, because maybe there was less engagement because people didn't know how. And everybody doesn't like to say, I don't know, right. <laughs> you know, but if you don't know, you don't know, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, 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 and we're helpers one to another to be able to, you know, um, help each other, because it, I think it really strengthens the faith of the congregants to yeah. know that someone is in touch 
with their pain that they deal with every day, you know, that some that their leadership uh, is in touch. So I think that, that's so commendable for you all to make that available um, to 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 anyone who, you know, will access it. Um, and it, 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 it could actually be a great move in the church that could uh, turn things around and <laughs> A faith builder. So that is great. But, you know, I know as we begin to uh, kind of wind down our conversation, what would you say to uh, to people uh, about, you know, social justice and the salvation issue? Because I think we still have to get people to start thinking that, you know, it's not just a social gospel. People like to separate and say, oh, that's a social gospel. And they don't understand, you know, that it is a part of our faith. Right. And that we're not taking away from the gospel. Could you speak to that? Absolutely. And you, you really hit on something. I mean, the, the whole point of naming the organization Salvation and Social Justice is because ultimately there is no salvation without social justice. You can't separate the two. Uh, you cannot have an honest reading of of the biblical text and not see very clearly throughout the entirety of, of the Old Testament all the way through Jesus to the advent of Jesus, salvation is synonymous with deliverance and liberation. Mm -hmm. And it is not merely some personal thing that you say and get, get absolved of sins. It is the, the, the act of salvation and God as a savior is a consistent communal deliverance. It's a deliverance of a people from oppressors. Even when the Messiah comes in the Christian context, Mary understands that the people are going to be delivered mm -hmm. and that she is a servant of the deliverer, the salvation of the people, not merely individual persons. And even the way that Jesus talks about salvation, Jesus said, I came to set the captives free. I came to preach, to bring good news to the poor, right? And so the Beatitudes are all about this communal deliverance. And so you cannot have salvation to, to, to there, this, this idea that somehow saying, Lord, forgive me of, of my sins. I believe in Jesus. Jesus died and rose again and now all of a sudden everything is all right and I get a get out of hell free card. That is absolutely no way in what, what Jesus had in mind when it came to the gospel. The gospel to Jesus is this idea of an upside down kingdom where the last will be first and the first will be last. That's the gospel. Jesus preaches a gospel of the kingdom of God in which equity and justice is done. And so it any other gospel outside of that, at best, is a sub gospel to what Jesus taught. And so we, we have to re understand what we've been taught by uh, mostly white Western theologians in order to keep us in check so that we are not advocates, so we are not passionate, so that we do not push for justice and have this idea of a Romanized Christianity rather than a Christianity and where this Jesus dies on a Roman cross in order to bring an indictment on the punitive nature of their system. And he goes to this cross because he's advocating for the poor and the oppressed and women and the marginalized. He's He goes there because he's fighting religious leaders who want to keep the status quo because it kept their pockets lined and kept their idea of a punitive religion in place. Mm -hmm. So there is no salvation without social justice. Anything else uh, is an anathema to the Jesus that did ministry for three years on earth. And what I would also say, the Jesus that is represented in the book of Revelation that is coming to set governments in check that have oppressed people. My goodness. I think we're going to have to lift the offering for that, which you just said. <laughs> That's a message. But that is so that is so key. Be and I, it, I think one of the last things I would say is that it seems as though 
they have made social justice like a political issue of whether you're Republican or Democrat. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. as though, you know, oh, it's just the Democrat. It's like a uh, liberal theology, you know, right. liberation. You know, you just everybody jumps on board. Everybody's free. And that is not really the case, is it? <laughs> That's right. Yeah, no, not at all. Not at all. And I and I, I, I would just say, you know, not to go too deep down another avenue, <laughs> but uh, uh, I'm, I'm one that says pretty boldly that that these these doctrines which which are fully against quote unquote being woke um, are in fact very uh, in line with what would be considered antichrist in the scripture. And I also just say that what Jesus said that if it were possible, <laughs> if it were possible, even the elect would be fooled. And so we got a whole lot of folks being fooled and acting foolish because they are really um uh, falling for an antichrist theology because anything that is anti-people, anti-health, anti-justice, anti-woke, when Jesus said, stay, stay, stay awake and pray, <laughs> stay woke. So anything anti to that is antichrist. Well, on that, all I can say is amen. <laughs> And 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 thank you again so much for being at the well. It's been so informative and so enlightening and impacting. And uh, it is my prayer that um, this will be fruitful um, in amplifying what salvation and uh, social justice is really all about and what they're doing. Because many people, as many, I'm sure of those 8,000 <laughs> persons that were released from prison, Family members were in different yeah. churches. So sometimes many people benefit and they don't even know who the benefactor is. Right. You know? yeah. So, I mean, it's a blessing to know that and to uh, also know that there is a, a place that they can um, go to for some of their you know, advocacy for some uh, problems that they couldn't get to uh, by some of the normal means. <laughs> So uh, I thank you so much for, for sharing with that today. And um, if there's any last words that you would like to say before we close out, anything that's on your heart, please feel free to say it. And after that, I'm going to ask you if you would close us out with prayer. Sure, sure. Now, I, I would just say I want to thank you uh, for your work and your ministry and, 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 and seeing the value and, and what a lot of us out here are doing. Uh, you know, I, I praise God for you and this platform. Uh, it's certainly anything that 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 we can do from the salvation, social justice, and from the greater Mount Zion. And uh, certainly, we want to be a resource to you in any way that 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 may look as possible. So, certainly grateful for you and your ministry and helping to to amplify truth uh, and and well being for our people. No, thank you so much. And having a voices like yours on the well actually does that and, and helps us to fulfill the purpose for which it was really built on. So thank you so much. And I'll ask you to close this out with prayer. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for, for this time. We thank you for your, your woman servant here who has just really been a blessing through this ministry. We thank you for meeting her at the well and for giving her living water. We thank you for your ministry, your work, your power. Lord God, uh, as as this broadcast will go forth, Lord, we pray that many would hear the clarion call to do salvation work, gospel work that is rooted in social justice, and that folks would understand how the two are inextricably linked. We thank you for your ministry, your power, and where you've advocated for the least of these. Now, Lord, bless everyone who hears this prayer, hears this broadcast, and may all of us do better yeah. to love you and to love our neighbor as ourselves. This is our prayer in the blessed name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. And viewers, thank you for being with us again. And we look forward to seeing you. We're going to put up all the information about a salvation and social justice and about Dr. Boyer, you know, how to get in touch with their team and, and uh, find out what you can do 
to help and be a blessing. And so we look forward to seeing you next time, next week, the same place, same time. And until then, stay well and stay safe. God bless you.